feel more insecure in their life, makes people <coughs> feel more vulnerable, and gives people less opportunity to do the things like holidays and nights out, etc., because we can't afford them, that help to keep you sane in a bad world. And so the government make you ill, and they then cut the services that are supposed to be there to help you when you get ill. So not only are they making us ill, they're also cutting mental health services massively. I mean, the health service itself has taken a £20 billion hit, and mental health has taken more than its fair share of that. People might know that mental health has been sort of found to have 27% of health need in Britain, and it receives only 13% of health um, funding, which means even if they doubled the amount of mental health money, right, doubled it, we still would not have parity with physical ill health. Now, I don't think physical ill health is well provided for. I think they've been cut to ribbons too. But when you think of it in those terms, we are absolutely still the Cinderella service of health services in Britain today. And I think that's something that we, I suppose people are here today partly to say they don't want that to continue. They don't want that to carry on. And you know, and they can say that it's because there's so many more elderly people in the world and that, that this is putting a huge strain on our health and our social care services. But I read a statistic the other day that said that there were nearly a million less old people receiving home care through councils now than there were at the beginning of this government. So even though there's more old people, and there's more very old people, less of them get that home care. So it's no wonder that our casualties are full and that our beds are full with people who might have been kept well. And that's the whole point really, is that a large amount of mental health that is incredibly distressing for people at the moment is preventable. It's not automatic that people are going to get the distress that they do. It's the product of the world we live in and a product of the lack of care when we develop those that means that we don't get it until I thought the quote was really good that, uh, that was on one of the slides that said you can't actually get a service until your foot, you've got one foot off the bridge ready to jump and that is true. You don't even necessarily get a service there. There are people who work on emergency duty teams who will tell you there is often not a mental health bed in England when you've got one foot off the end of a, of a bridge and are actually uh, about to jump. And I think that is an absolute disgrace and they've got away with this not because it's not an accident that they've done it. I think this government never wanted the health service when it was brought in in 1948. They didn't want a welfare state, they didn't want benefits, they didn't want pensions, they didn't want leisure centres, they didn't want any of the things that make our lives better. And they've used this recession to get rid of a lot of what they didn't want in the first place and they're continuing to try um, to do so. And they attempt to get away with it by getting us to fight each other and divide amongst ourselves. I think the worst example of it is the attack on, uh, on migrant workers and the Islamophobia that I think is rife in the world and Britain at the moment. And it's interesting in the health service. The health service was built by immigrants. My mum answered an advert in Germany in 1949 to come to this country to work in a, to become a mental health nurse because they created the health service and didn't have enough mental health nurses and cleaners to do it. And a coach load of German workers came over and we've seen Afro-Caribbean workers, we've seen Italian workers, we've seen Filipino workers, we've seen people from all across the world come and create our health service keep our health service going and actually together, if we don't fight together, we won't be able to fight to keep that health service together and I think the idea that you remove the 40% of nurses who are migrant workers or the 25% of doctors or the tens of thousands of porters and uh, domestics who are migrant workers, the health service would collapse tomorrow and, it's, and to be honest, UKIP don't care because they've got private insurance because they're bankers, Cameron doesn't care because he's got a millionaire and he's got private insurance but for the 90% of us we do care and it makes a difference and that's why I think people are here today and I'm really encouraged by the fact that people are here today. I'm encouraged by all the campaigns that I've heard about that I didn't know about all of them and, and all of the details of what they do. And I think what's true is that people are trying to fight that fight and what we need to do is try and make it easier to do so. I think it's a good idea to try and set up some national network but it's quite difficult to do. I wonder whether just as a starting point we should set up a Facebook sort of page where people can at least post on nationally a mental health campaign. Lots, most people seem to do Facebook 
apparently it's going to go out in a few years' time. I've only just caught on, which is part of, the, <laughs> part of the course, really. And I think we should consider doing that as a way of trying to uh, step together. I think the fact that there's a general election on, people should use these postcards and send them to their prospective parliamentary candidates. It's interesting that all three political parties have got mental health pledges that they're trying to make a lot out of. And I think they're doing that because mental health is votes to them. They think it makes a difference, but the tiny amounts of money that they're giving will not make much of an impact on the massive cuts that they've already made already and the massive more cuts that they've committed to all the three main political parties if they're elected. And therefore, I think we have to say, we want you to create the parity that you talk about, we want you to double the mental health budget, and we'll then have a debate and an argument about how exactly we want that spending. Do we want more of the same or something? Something different, and I think that's a good thing that you can get. It's big piles of them outside, but you should take them and give them to their friends and their mates. Because I think if candidates and MPs and councillors receive these, it begins to put it up on their agenda. And I suppose that's what I want to end with, because I actually think mental health campaigns are in the public mind. I've done NHS campaigning for a long time and general political campaigning for a long time. And if you put a don't close Bolton a and &E stall up in the Bolton Town Hall Square and get a big queue of people signing it, if you put a don't privatise Bolton psychological therapy service, which sounds not quite as dynamic, um, and you know, don't privatise mental health services, you get a big queue of people signing and you can't put the stall down. It's not the case that mental health isn't popular, it's not the case that it's not known, it's actually a very, very popular campaign. I think it's as popular as the A&E campaign when you stand on a street stall and campaign about it. And that's why it's important that you get your colleagues and your youth friends and your care friends and people who are interested to stand on those stalls with you. Because most people didn't believe that it would be like that until they did it. My colleagues thought we would be laughed at when we said don't privatise the, uh, the mental health services. They really thought that and were amazed when people were queuing up to say we've got 8,000 signatures in six weeks and they haven't uh, privatised it as a result of that petition that we collected. We were too much trouble. It's like you're standing there, the waves are coming towards you, and there's nothing you can do about it. The, the cuts are not like the, the sea. It is not inevitable. It is a choice that a set of people are making, and if the majority of us who oppose those stand up and say we won't have it, you can stop them from making those cuts. And I think that's the message we have to come out of here. We need to stand together, don't let them divide us, workers, sort of non-workers, people who are well so-called or people who are sick so-called, people who are on benefits, people who are mi migrants or British, whoever we are, we stand together, we fight for the services that we believe in and we fight to improve the services that we believe in with more money but also with the sort of services that we want that are actually delivering for people rather than some of the services that don't at the moment but we can only do that if we're getting out and fighting and that's why, come on all the events that we've talked about, come Come to the Manchester uh, Devo Mank demonstration on the 29th. Come to the one on the 19th about benefits. Join in all the activities you can and tell people about it. I think we have a world to win. For some, I think mental health and the health service generally sums up what sort of world do we want. Do we want a world where they prioritise 120 billion on trying to kill people rather than on a service to actually help and cure people who are ill? They're the choices that we face in the world at the moment and we make a difference which side we take and what we do. And I'm really heartened by the conference today and I think we should go out and do that that we've talked about. Thank you.